Stanford University. Welcome to Stanford Medicine's 10th Annual Contemplation by Design Summit. I'm Dr. Tia Rich, the founder and director of Contemplation by Design, and it is my deep honor to introduce our speaker, Brenda Salgado. Brenda spoke to us uh, previously in the summit about mindfulness, indigenous prophecy, and the time of the sixth sun. In today's session, she will be providing an interactive workshop experience titled Healing with the Ancestors, Toltec Practices for Intergenerational Flourishing. Brenda Salgado is the founder of Napantla Consulting and program director of the Racial Healing Initiative. She is a mindfulness author, speaker, wisdom keeper. Toltec energy healer, trainer, and organizational consultant. She holds degrees in biology, developmental psychology, and animal behavior. In the past, she has served as the director of the San Francisco Bay Area's East Bay Meditation Center, as associate director at Wisdom and Money, and as a senior fellow at the Movement Strategy Center, and is the author editor of Real World Mindfulness for Beginners, Navigate Daily Life One Practice at a Time. Join me in warmly welcoming Brenda Salgado. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's an honor to meet you and to spend time with you this evening. I know that you all have busy lives, so I'm grateful um, for those of you who were able to make it here this evening. So I always like to start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Brenda Salgado, and I'm the daughter of Carlos and Esmeralda Salgado, who are there in the middle there. That's my mom and my dad. Um, and they're both still alive, 84 and 85, living in Daly City, California, where I was born and raised. And they were both born and raised in Nicaragua. And they knew each other as young kids. They had family and friends in common, so they knew each other growing up. And my dad secretly had a crush on her and <laughs> um, but was a good friend of the family. And then he came to the U.S. when he was 15, became a citizen, joined the army. And when he got out of the army, he wrote to my grandfather and asked if he could marry my mom and if they would send her to San Francisco. And so miraculously, she decided to go, which is a big leap um, coming so far, not speaking English, not having family here. Uh, that was a lot of trust. So I'm grateful because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. Um, and they're both still alive, living in the house that I grew up in, in Daly City. And they live with my brother, who uh, helps my mom with caretaking for my dad, who now has Alzheimer's and dementia. So I'm really grateful my brother's there supporting. Uh, but just really grateful to my parents. They raised us with a lot of Nicaraguan culture, a lot of Nicaraguan food. And what I would say, I think because they were born and raised in Nicaragua, coming very much from the culture of we, a family, of taking care of each other, I um, was raised by a lot of uh, help from my aunties and my uncles and family friends from Nicaragua. So I really did feel the sense of a village raising me, not just a nuclear family. And it wasn't really apparent to me that how kind of more individualistic this culture is until I hit school. So I'm really grateful that they steeped us in that feeling of family and, and living in a culture that operates from the we and not from the me. Um, so grateful to them, and they're of uh, both indigenous Choratega descent from Nicaragua as well as Spanish European. So it's a blending of that in, in both my parents. And on the bottom right, you'll see my mom's parents, Maria, who is indigenous Choratega and was also a medicine person and healer. And then my grandfather Arnoldo with her. And then on the other side, my grandmother Mariana, who I did grow up with here in San Francisco, and then my grandfather, my dad's side, Felipe on the left side, who I never met. Um, he didn't raise my father, but my dad did meet him as an adult. So, and grateful that he gave life to my dad and he had cared, my dad carries a lot of his good gifts. Um, so I'm grateful for all of them, even if I didn't meet them all in this lifetime. And then I'm also really grateful to the lands that held me growing up and particularly Growing up in California in Daly City, uh, unceded Ohlone territories, spent a lot of time at Ocean Beach, a lot of time up in the mountains, a lot of time talking to trees and animals here. I was always a very spiritual kid and 
very connected to the natural world. So I'm grateful for the ways that the natural world continues to hold me and help me as a child as well. And then I'm very grateful to the lands in Nicaragua. My mom and dad were both born and raised in small villages surrounding Volcan Masaya, just south of Managua, and have a lot of family that was raised in that area. So I'm very grateful to those lands because they held my ancestors over many, many generations. And uh, like I like to share this image, ancestral mathematics, because it helps us kind of have a perspective of what it took for us to be here. Assuming we don't have like cousins that were really close that were intermarried, which happens. My parents are actually cousins, distant cousins. <laughs> so that does collapse this a little bit. But if we didn't have any ancestors who were related to each other, this is what it would look like. If we'd have two parents, four grandparents, eight great grandparents, and go so on down the line. So for us to be born today from 12 previous generations, we would need a total of over 4,000 ancestors over the last 400 years. So that's a lot of people that came before us. And we don't always know all their stories or even their names. So I like to think a lot about how many struggles were there amongst them? How many battles, how many challenges did they go through? How much trauma? difficulties and sadness, but also the ancestors are always reminding me how much happiness, how much joy, how many love stories, how many expressions, prayers, ceremonies they did for the hope for the future and for future generations. So they had to undergo great many things for us to exist in this present moment. And so I'm very grateful to the ancestors. It was uh, not long ago, I was asked to do ceremony on a former slave plantation and we're doing a blessing and a clearing of energies at the home of formerly enslaved uh, peoples on that property that still, the, the little cabin still existed. And many of us from different spiritual traditions went there together to do some clearing and healing on that land. And I was guided to do some ceremony and to cleanse the space with a lot of plant medicine, a lot of smudging, a lot of sound medicine. Um, and I remember the ancestors from that place speaking to me. They asked me to place some offerings in the hearth of the small home. And they said, please remind everyone, though there was a lot of suffering here, there was also a lot of love, a lot of beauty, a lot of singing, a lot of prayer. We actually prayed you all into being so you could be here to bless this space now. And that wasn't possible in our time. So I was really grateful to receive that message. And uh, I like to share a lot about Coco. It's one of my favorite movies. If you haven't seen it already, I uh, encourage you to see it. Um, it gave me a lot of joy to watch this with my family. Um, it's set you know, a lot around Mexican culture and Day of the Dead, but as someone who is trained to do a lot of work with healing uh, in the ancestor world and reconnecting and bridging our world and the non-human world and the ancestor world. Uh, it gave me a lot of joy to be able to talk to my mom about why I love this so much and why it's so important to remember and honor our ancestors and their stories and to do the healing work so that we maintain those relationships and connections. It's, it was, yeah, it's very emotional when I was watching that film. Um, and this is a photo of, um, I used to be the director of the East Bay Meditation Center in Oakland, California. If you haven't been there, it's a very unique place. It's considered one of the most diverse Buddhist communities in the world. Um, so it's and very social justice minded. So it's a really special place. Though I'm not the director there anymore, I feel like so much. Um, I learned so much from the teachers there. And one of the things we would do every year is do uh, an ancestor altar together. So this, I believe, was from 2014. Um, and we'd have just a way of honoring all of our ancestors together. So many of our ancestor ceremonies for our peoples in the past would have been a communal event, not just individual. We, we'd have our ancestor altars at home, but we'd also have um, community rituals to do, to do such work. Um, and there's traditions from all over the world and different, there's no one right way to have an ancestor altar. Um, but there's definitely different ways that people like to do that. So I often encourage people to do that if they aren't doing it already. Um, in particular for this um, person, they of Icelandic uh, background, she has things 
not just photos of her grandparents, she also has um, something that was embroidered by her grandmother. So there's so many different ways to tend to and create ancestor altars in this modern context as individuals. And as I mentioned also, cultures all around the world have communal ancestor honoring ceremonies. Uh, on the left, you'll see pictures from the Japanese Obon Festival, uh, a lot of lanterns that represent the honoring of ancestors. There's usually a lot of dancers as well, particular foods. Um, so there's this sense of family commemoration, ancestral commemoration as part of the larger culture. Uh, so you're doing that alone in your own home, but you're also doing that communally together at particular times of year. And on the right, you'll also see a beautiful image from uh, black owned Brooklyn, who did a tribute to the ancestors of the Middle Passage, those, those who went through the Middle Passage of uh, being brought as slaves to the, to the colonies and to other places, and they're pouring libations, so pouring libations is a particular um, African ritual of honoring as we pour waters um, to our ancestors as well. So all those things are very important and still carried on today. And you may have been at things where people do things similar to this. Um, the lanterns are usually put out as someone's died. You're honoring that person when they put the paper lanterns onto the water. And then you know, again, the theme of water is very common um, of, of pouring the libations for water uh, when an ancestor dies. And water seems very significant. I know, I, I know that I've heard in some of um, some of the sharings from different folks about libations that there's no one set way to do libations and and it's just about simply honoring your ancestors and those who came before you who had laid the foundation so that you could be here today and water is very um, a big deal that and um, as an offering as well because water does not they say that water has no enemies that they it flows uh, what lays as spirit flows so there's often done um, with water as well, in, often into the earth or a plant uh, because we want to sprinkle that um, in that way. And it, we're talking a lot about nourishing the spirit of our ancestors when we're pouring that water. We're talking about honoring them and the gifts that they gain, telling their stories as we pour the libations or we honor their names and, and the things that they left behind. So this is an acknowledgement of those who came before and have been instrumental in our lives and in our lineages. And you can pour libations, not just for family members, I've often been at various social justice gatherings and ceremonies where we honor those spiritual teachers who came before us and those movement leaders who came before us that paved the way so that things could be different for us today. So it can be just a way of honoring and remembering those who came before us uh, that feel important to us to remember and honor. Now we'll talk a little bit about working with ancestors. Um, I mentioned ancestor altars. A lot of times people will talk to me about, you know, wanting to have an ancestor altar, um, not knowing where to start, um, feel, wondering if there is one right way to do that. And they're, they're really, what a lot of things I'll say is just to think about honoring them. Some common things around ancestor altars are putting up pictures if we have them, sometimes putting up their names if we don't, um, or just um, having a figure that represents our an ancestors. I often recommend that people think about representing the four elements on those ancestors, earth, uh, air, water, and fire. Um, but also to allow some intuition into what you put on your altar. Every once in a while, my ancestors will ask for a spirit plate, which means they want me to put something on the altar for a little while that represents some of the foods that they like. So sometimes my maternal grandmother will ask me to put pan dulce or some kind of sweet bread or pastry on there, along with some coffee. And she always tells me she wants a lot of sugar in it because she knows I don't drink coffee and also that when I do drink coffee, I only have um, creamer, but no sugar. <laughs> and that I don't actually eat a lot of pastries and sweets either. Um, so she'll ask me for those things and that's very sweet. And a lot of times when I'm doing ancestor healing ceremonies, they'll ask me for those things too. And I'll leave them on there for a little while and then I might eat them later or might offer them to the earth later. So just depending on what I get called to do. But I, I always like to spend a little bit of time 
thinking about those things. Um, in a moment, what I'd like to do is allow you to perhaps share a little bit with each other in breakouts about your relationship with your ancestors now. And there's no right or wrong answer. I mean, I think all of us are in different relationship to this and there's a reason you're here. And some of you might have had a long-term relationship with ancestors that you've been cultivating a long time. Some of you may be tiptoeing into this territory for the first time and are a little nervous about it and not sure how to engage. Um, and that's okay too. Uh, there's no right or wrong. Um, I know that I felt always connected to my maternal grandmother, but I didn't really have a lot of relationship with the other grandparents on the ancestor side after they passed until later in my life when I started doing ancestor ceremonies and asking for my relationship. And so again, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, so what I'd like to do, let me see how many of you there are, about 30, perhaps we can grow in groups of uh, three. And then when you're in your group, you'll have about three minutes each to share. So please be mindful of time and, and set someone to time, you know, or time yourself, whichever feels more appropriate, because you want to share that space equitably. And it's, if we, if we don't watch them, perhaps the first person may up, end up taking half the time. Um, so this is part of our, our learning to share space. But what I want you to do is just share, do you have an ancestor altar? Yes or no, no right or wrong answer. And if you do, then what, what, uh, how do you work with that answer, ancestor altar? What do you have on it? And if, even if it's a no, I don't have an ancestor altar, just share a little bit of stories around some of the ancestors you do know, that you respect, that you appreciate, um, who you emulate. Perhaps they have some, perhaps you learned about a great grandmother who was a lot like you. You never met them, but you have similar personality traits that you've heard about. So just let it be a free flow, what's on your heart about your relationship with ancestors and your relationship with an ancestor altar, if you have one. And again, no right or wrong answers, answers, just what's on your heart around your current relationship with ancestors. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to share with each other. And before I move on with the presentation, I wanted to see if there's anything that stood out to you all in your shares, something that was it's on your heart to share that was, that was meaningful for you to share in the larger group too. We have time for a few shares for those folks that want to share something that's on their heart. Yeah, I'm sure that must mean so much to him on the other side. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Mm, that's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah, I know that um, my mom and dad named me after siblings who died young. My father had a little sister named Brenda who died as a baby. And then my mom had a daughter, a sister who died as a teenager named Alicia. So that's my name, Brenda Alicia Sanigavo. And I love the stories that they share about them, even though they weren't here that long. Really, really beautiful stories. And I feel like they're watching over me because I'm carrying their names and that they came here to spread their medicine even though their time here was short, but they were beautiful beings. Thank you for that share. Yeah, that means a lot to me and reminds me of my father's upbringing, I mean, my father, my husband's upbringing, 
my husband is German Norwegian descent and his father was German and he was a carpenter and, and that, you know, they had passed things down. He told her all five of his sons to be good carpenters. And they all have these distinct memories of him going to take them to the hardware store for the first time, showing them how to pick out a hammer or another tool and how to look at it and its quality so they know it's gonna last a long time. And then also would take them home and teach them how to take care of that tool so it would last them their whole life. And they all kind of carry really strong stories and memories of their father doing that with them. I think his father, his father's past, I think he would lament greatly just in his day, things were built to last. And um, in, in this present day, there's this all planned obsolescence and you make things cheaply. So you have to go back and buy them regularly. Um, but his father, you know, he he had a lot of tools that belonged to his father. He passed those tools on to his sons when he was getting older. Uh, they still have those tools and they're very strong and sturdy and have been in multiple generations. And uh, so, yeah, they resonate with that a lot, that that the, that was a big thing in his family line, like the take care of your things so that they'll last you a long time so that you can pass them on. It's very cool. Well, thank you for your shares. I'll move on unless there's someone else that has a burning thing on their heart to share. <laughs> I always like to hear people's stories. So I want to share, Indigenous people like to share through personal story. Um, and so I'll share a couple themes um, that I like to share with people, especially if they're first starting to work up with ancestors. Um, I'll, and so I'll kind of touch on the themes first and then come back into the main uh, so you can see my face. But one thing I would say is start with the healthier ones. Um, we all have healthy and less healthy ancestors. And so it's good to start with the ones that we know kind of lived in a good way and ask them for their help and build that relationship first. And they can help us turn towards some of the ones who are less healthy um, to help with some of that healing as we build those relationships. Um, one of my elders once said to me, if you don't have healthy boundaries with humans in this life, then you're probably not going to have healthy boundaries with ancestors either. So I'll share some stories about that. And then I'll share a little bit more about indigenous teachings around why it's really important to do ancestral healing work right now. We're carrying what we call ancestral old winds and ancestral patterns of self-sabotage um, that get passed down the line. And in this time of prophecy and indigenous calendar, it's always been important to heal those things, but it's also really, really important in this time. And I'll share a little bit more about why that is. Those of you who are, who are here with me uh, the other night will some of that will be a little bit repeat in condensed form, but it's important context for why ancestral healing is so important right now. And then also, like I like I mentioned with the ancestors, when I was asked to do that healing and clearing at uh, the, the cabin of formerly enslaved peoples on the plantation, uh, they want us to honor their gifts and their blessings. Our ancestors were complicated and beautiful beings, and they had gifts and blessings, but they also had challenges and trauma. And so in order to access some of the gifts and blessings that they want to give us, it's helpful to help clear some of the trauma and the difficult things. And also so that we're not repeating those patterns in our lives or passing them down towards future generations. And then um, the last thing I'll say is just like I, part of, I've always been connected to my maternal grandmother and she's always been around and talking to me since I was a little girl. She died when I was a little girl. But uh, I do know also that when I started to do Buddhist ancestor practice, uh, this practice called Five Touchings of the Earth. I didn't realize I was setting some things in motion and asking for more guidance and relationship from those ancestors. And I'm grateful for that. There's so many different ways to do ancestor ceremony and ask for that connection. And we can talk more about that as well. Um, but I'll stop the share there just because I wanted to give some big themes that I'm going to talk about. Um, because I feel like uh, Indigenous folks always like to share from personal story. Um, and so the, that first theme was about starting with the healthier ones. And that's, that's a really important story in my journey. Um, I will say that at one point on my altar, I had three of the four grandparents. I mentioned that I didn't ever meet my paternal grandfather because he left my grandmother when she was pregnant with my dad and he didn't raise my dad. So I wasn't raised around him. But at one point I was doing a lot of ceremony and, you know, training on this medicine path and 
And I had the other three grandparents on my altars because I knew them growing up and I had pictures of them from my parents. And at one point, um, I had started a women's moon circle where we'd meet on the new moon and full moon and we'd do a lot of ceremony together. And sometimes I would invite guest teachers to come and I invited a teacher I know named Naman Yasopan who, who came and did some uh, meditation and journeying work with us. And she said she was gonna take us to meet with some of our ancestors. And in that meditation, we went and I was expecting to see those three grandparents because they'd been on my altar for a while. But what was interesting is that other grandfather came, Felipe, and it was a very difficult experience for me for the first time. Um, he was very demanding. He said, why am I not on your altar? I demand to be on your altar. Uh, all the other three grandparents are on your altar. And he just seemed kind of upset, you know. And, uh, you know, at first I just took a breath. And then in that meeting with him, I said, you know, um, thank you for giving life to my father. Um, thank you. Um, I know that part of you runs in him and part of you runs in me. So you're part of my line. Um, so thank you for giving him life because I wouldn't be here if you hadn't given my father life. And I said, after that, I said, um, with, with love and respect, I just want to say that it's not my fault that you're not on my own altar. Um, if you had raised my father, I would have so many stories of you. If you had raised my father, I would have so many pictures of you but I don't have either. And so it's not my fault that you're not on my altar. And I said, I know when I was in college at some point, you know, several decades ago, my father found you and he and my mom went and met you very briefly in Nicaragua. And you met, he met some of his half brothers from your marriage. And I said, that's the only contact my father ever had with you. Um, and I said, I think there's one or two photos from that, but I'm not sure they even still have them or where they are and if they're in the attic buried away some somewhere. I said, I'll ask, but I just want to be clear that it's not my fault that you're not on my ancestor altar. And I was a little kind of shook up from that experience. So I went to go see an elder I knew to ask their advice about this because it felt a little different than my other ancestor engagements up to that point. And she said to me that phrase, like if you don't have healthy boundaries with humans in this life, then you're probably not going to have healthy boundaries with ancestors and other spirit beings. So it's important that you learn that, especially on the medicine path that you're on. And she said, let me check in on him. And she said, oh yeah, he has some things to work on on the other side. You know, he let, he was a good person, but he also had some th you know, shadowy things. And, and she said, what I want you to do is just contact him again and just say, I would really love a relationship with you like I have with my other grandparents, but I'm aware that we have some work to do on your line before we get there. And so I'm going to start working on your part of the ancestor line to do healing work. And I'm going to ask you to do work from your side on that too. And then maybe at some point where it feels like it's right, um, like contact me again, but not until it can be a mutually respectful relationship. Um, but for now, I'm just going to start praying and working and healing on your part of the line. And I'm going to ask you to do the same so we can meet back here someday. And so, and, but please don't contact me again until it can be mutually respectful and know that I love you and I'm working on this so we can get there someday. And so then kind of radio silence from him for several years. Um, but I kept sharing the story when I was working with people who are starting to do work with their ancestors. And then fast forward a couple of years uh, in our women's circle, we were doing a day of the dead gathering in a friend's backyard and they had set up the big altar and we brought all of our pictures. And we were also watching, the kids wanted to watch Coco. So we watched Coco and it talked about ancestors that way too. Um, but he showed up when we started doing the ceremony. I felt him for the first time after so many years. And he said to me, thank you so much. I'm so grateful for all the work you've been doing to help heal the line. And um, I'm ready to be in respectful relationship with you. And I've been doing work on this side too. And I wanna help you. You've been praying at the altar for an ancestor who held power with integrity. I'm actually the ancestor that can help you with that. And then I was like, oh, I didn't think it would be you. That's so interesting. Um, so we just never know. We don't know all the stories of our ancestors. And so I was very grateful and he walks with me now and he's a very good protector and, and we've gotten to heal some of the things in his part of the line that were really, you know, troubling him and hurting him. So I'm very grateful that both he and the other grandmother are like the strong ancestor guides and protectors now. Uh, he carried so many stories that came out after I started 
it was interesting right after we had that conversation my mom and dad didn't know anything about any of this um I wasn't talking to them about it but right after that happened my mom just happened to be in the attic and found those two pictures um and she says hey look what I found <laughs> it's like oh interesting and then they both started telling me all these beautiful stories about Felipe because he was good friends with my mother's mother and so though my father didn't wasn't raised with him my mom's mom would frequently tell him you know I know your dad didn't raise you but he was a good man and I want to tell you some stories about him because you know um I want you to know who your father was and so actually all the good stories my father had of him was from my mom's mom which is really really sweet and so uh, I feel really grateful to have come back full circle and that Philippe is a big part of my life and that he's on my altar and he's on the slide that I showed you earlier today that's been a real blessing to have him in in the in the mix there he's a very good ancestor so that was one of the things I wanted to share about start with the healthier ones and cultivate healthy boundaries if an ancestor is not being respectful with you you can ask for boundaries like even even if they're being kind to you and you love them my grandmother at one point the one that walks with me the most at the very beginning, she was telling me you come from a long line of medicine women. You have to ask your mom about stories of healings that did in Nicaragua. And then the other thing she said was I left something unresolved with your mom when I died and I feel really bad about it. And I want her forgiveness. I want to know if she's forgiven me. And she would not tell me what it was. And, but she said, your mom will know once you start this conversation. And it took me some time to get the nerve up to start that conversation <laughs> Um, and also to do it in a place that felt appropriate. Um, my mom and I are frequently with all the family eating and it's like really noisy and loud. And I, and I knew this conversation had to happen just the two of us in a quiet space with not a lot of other people around. And so I remember because she finally had an outlet and someone who could help her with this thing that she's been carrying. It's almost like my grandma every day was like, have you talked to her yet? Have you talked to her yet? <laughs> and, I, and at some point I had to tell grandma, I said, I love you. And I'm going to take care of this, but I have to find the right time. And it would be really helpful if you didn't ask me every day. Like, you know, um, I, it's on my to-do list. And I know you've been waiting a long time for this. And then you're going to have to wait a little longer until she, mom and I can have this conversation alone. And I, and I said, and we're going off to the cabin pretty soon. And I think that's the right place. So please don't ask me every day. And she kind of mellowed out. <laughs> So we get, you just like I said, you know, we get to have healthy boundaries with ancestors, just like we do with people. And she was so relieved when I talked to my mom. My mom said, there's, I understand what happened. I know she didn't have a lot of power and choice in that situation. And she's like, there's nothing to forgive. I'm not angry with her. My grandma was, I could feel her relief when we had, and, and gratitude when we had that conversation. But like I said, good boundaries with our ancestors, you know. Of course, they have needs and agendas, just like humans do. And we get to tell them what we can and can't do or what we're willing and not willing to do. And, and, um, and we can empathize with their pain and their concerns, um, just like we do with other people. And we still get to have agency. And every, every relationship is, is a negotiation and an and a honoring of each other's. You know, the, I often hear boundaries is boundary, healthy boundaries are the way I can love myself and love you at the same time. And that's necessary with the ancestors, just it is, as it is with human beings, other human beings. So those are important things to mention. Um, and then I wanted the last story I want to share about my personal things is just that, um, I was raised Catholic and was a really spiritual kid. And I was glad I was raised Catholic because I got to be a, talk about my relationship with spirit and God and trees and, you know, things. Um, and as I got older, I think um, I told my mom, my connection to spirit is so deeply connected to nature and so deeply connected to ancestors. And there's not a lot of room for that in the tradition we're in. So what I told her is like, it's like a jacket that doesn't quite fit me because my direct relationship with spirit tends to happen when I'm out in nature under a tree or, you know, um, I said, I love going to church and my connection is stronger when I'm nature. And I don't know why that is. And I said, and second is my connection to spirit is so connected to talking to grandma. And so that's, I, I need to go find a jacket that fits me where I find a spirituality that has the ancestor and the nature things more explicit. And of course that led me to Buddhism and a lot of Native American ceremony and it, that felt like jackets that fit me. And uh, particularly I was really drawn to Thich Nhat Hanh 
uh, from the Vietnamese uh, Buddhist tradition because he was very explicit about the relationship to ancestors and nature. And I'll share in the link, well, you don't have to go there now, but um, if you wanna save the chat, you can or, or click on it and save it for later. But one of the things that they had was this thing called the five earth touchings, where you're doing prostrations for uh, your an biological ancestors, your spiritual ancestors, um, for the land and your on land that you're on and those who came before you, for um, your loved ones, your family and friends. And then the last one is about compassion and forgiveness for those who have uh, hurt you and your loved ones. Um, but that one, first one around the ancestors, you're really kind of doing these frustrations, thanking your ancestors, acknowledging that they had their own challenges and their own beauty and gifts, and that you really want more relationship with them and, um, and that you want to honor them. And one particular birthday, I made these big um, kind of altars with pictures on them that had my biological ancestors, my spiritual ancestors, my loved ones. And I did that ceremony every day for seven days. And I didn't realize that I was setting something in motion with grandma because I was reading this thing every day about wanting more relationship. And even though she had been around and guiding me all the time, she said, oh, I'm glad that you did this thing. You know, it's time for us to start working more deeply together. And I was waiting for you to be ready. And, and she, that's when she kind of said, you know, come from these long line of medicine women, you don't know about this. And you have to start asking about healings that I did in Nicaragua with my children. Um, and she said, it's time for you to start training. And I'm going to start setting you medicine teachers. And she said, please check in with me every time a teacher comes on your path, because not everyone's meant to be your teacher. And she's very clear with the yeses and nos. So I'm glad to have that kind of guidance from the other side. Um, but yeah, this is, I think that's um, one example of, of many different ways that we can be in ceremony and honoring our ancestors. It's not the only way, but I like to share kind of what opened up those doors for me. So I wanted to share, you know, that's a little bit about personal story with ancestors. Um, a lot of times those messages come to me when I'm in meditation and in nature. A lot Sometimes they come to me when I'm in the dream time. A lot of times grandma visits me in the dream time. And I'm grateful for that. Um, but I wanted to share a little bit about what I shared last time about why some of this is so important right now. But we're, we are really in this time of indigenous prophecy about coming in to balance around our masculine and our feminine. There's a lot of indigenous prophecies around that. But in particular, I wanna talk about the Toltec prophecies and calendars. Um, our understanding is that we're ending a particular 6,625 year period, which is more of a cosmic you know, calendar. And that these big cycles of 6,625 years have to do with lessons in, in evolutions and consciousness that humanity is going through. And in this particular time, we're ending the time of the fifth sun and entering the time of the sixth sun. Um, so right in that transitional time, and I won't go into the first through the fourth suns because we don't have time, but we this time that we're ending, the time of the fifth sun is considered the knife of justice. It's the time of duality, of patriarchy, of all the isms, racism, sexism of separation from ourselves, from each other, from source, from spirit, and particularly from Mother Earth and the feminine ways of practicing spirituality, the more intuitive ways. So we're out of balance. And, and a lot of that relates to that eagle condor prophecy. We're supposed to fly in balance with the wing of the eagle and the condor, the masculine, the intellect, you know, and doing things in the physical realm. But also we have the condor medicine, which is about the feminine, the intuitive, the connection with the earth. And so a person who's supposed to be flying in balance is operating with both their intellect and their intuition and living primarily from their heart because they're living in that balance. The time of the fifth sun is a time of um, a lot of um, overextending and unhealthy forms of the eagle or the masculine and being thinking that the intellect is the only thing that's important and the repression of the feminine and the intuition and the connection with the earth the domination of the earth as well, the ways that we treat the earth. And the time of the sixth sun that we're starting, this is about coming into our kids self, what consciousness, but my teachers often say, don't get fundamentals about any of it. What we call kids self, what consciousness, others might call Christ consciousness, Buddha consciousness, unity consciousness. It's about coming back into that balance and remembering who we are, that, that we're both a child of the earth and the universe. 
that we have the capacity to co-create with the universe when we're in right relationship to those relationships. Um, and that we have to find balance and integration. And that the time of the sixth sun is very much about going into the inner path and doing the inner work. And then some of the key things around why the ancestor work today is because one of the things that our teachers have taught us is that in order to step into our Quetzalcoatl consciousness, we have to come back into that balance around the masculine and feminine, the intellect, the intuition, the relationship with the cosmos, the relationship with the earth. Um, and also that we can't get there if we're not doing work to clear the karmic and ancestral trauma energies that are in our lines. And some of us came here to do that in this time to help our ancestors feel more peaceful where they are, but also so that the next seven generations are not carrying those same patterns and karma moving forward so that they can inherit the time of the sixth sun with more ease and grace and be more on their path of who they truly are. And so the ancestor work is very important right now. And I'll stop the share there to share a little bit about um, a practice that I would love to share with you today. But before I jump into the, the Toltec practice, I just wanted to see if there's any questions or things that are on people's hearts, because that was a lot of information so far. <laughs> just have a clarification. With the 6,625, I think you said it was, um, cycle, does that mean that the sixth sun will last for 6,000 years? Yes, and then there'll be a seventh sun and an eighth sun and a ninth sun. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I shared on the other call last time too is, so through oral tradition, you know, we've obviously been through one through five if we're going from the fifth to the sixth. And one of the things that the teachers started telling us back, you know, 2009, 2012, around that time was that this time was approaching, that we needed to be prepared for it. Um, they also said that when these transitions happen, there's a lot of chaos that happens, which is to be expected in a big transition. So they said any time that we go through one of these transitions that to expect a lot of natural disasters, um, also to expect a lot of death because not everyone's choosing to make kind of that evolutionary leap in consciousness. And that's not a conscious thing. Uh, it's more our higher self, you know, choosing to, to be with that program or not. Uh, so they said a lot of natural disasters, a lot of death, and then also to expect a lot of collapse in systems because the systems that we had, whether they're educational or health or, you know, financial, whatever those things are, they were created in the consciousness of the fifth son with that consciousness. So of course, they're not going to serve in the time of the sixth son because that's supposed to be created in a different consciousness. So they said, expect a lot of collapse of systems. Um, and then expect a lot of young people that are coming in with blueprints for the new systems and the new consciousness and, and to help them cultivate those things because they're being born in a different time. They're of a different consciousness. Um, and uh, this is a time of a lot of experimentation and newness um, as these new things are, are happening. And so because of those things being told to me, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I'm not surprised about the things that have been happening. Doesn't mean I don't carry grief or sadness around the loss and chaos that erupts in that process, but I also understand it in a larger context and that the more that we can feed the energy and the consciousness of the sixth sun in ourselves and around us, that that, that is the most important thing to be doing right now. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because it's a conversation I've had a lot with my husband. He's 12 years older than I am. And he's definitely someone that when we first got married 19 years ago was really uncomfortable with change. Like he's definitely, I think was a routine kind of person. And some of that was about his personality. And some of that was response to trauma when he was a child too, you know. Um, but one of the things that I kept sharing with him that some of my elders talked about was like, this time is coming that's going to be very chaotic and a lot of unknown 
And uh, one of the things they said was like, those who have built community, those who are in ceremony with the earth and, and community, not just by themselves, but in community. Um, and those who are like learning to co-create and adapt to change in community, those things are gonna be really important. The people that don't do those things are gonna have a really hard time navigating this time. So I kept trying to prepare him for like, um, what are the practices that help you to be, be with things when they're not what you expect or to be in the unknown, right? Um, because there's so many teachings and so many lineages there's around, like there's the suffering that's actual physical suffering of things that happen to us. And then there's a suffering that's, that we create mentally because we have an expectation that things be exactly the way we want. And of course, life is not like that. And so how do we cultivate the practice to be present with what's in front of us at all times, regardless of whether it's the thing we want or expect. Um, and so I think mindfulness practices, uh, breath practices, somatic practices, like teaching this at large scales is really important for people to build that capacity to be in the unknown together and alone too. Um, yeah. And I think you're, we're just going to see a lot of people in different ways exiting this plane of existence um, if they're really being challenged with that. Um, the other things I think the teachers have said that I shared last in a couple of days ago was um, they said there's a reason that mindfulness and yoga have spread all over the globe at a, in the time that was preceding this transition. Um, and that's about people getting more present, more inner, more capacity in their breath to be present. Um, and then they also said, you should expect in the time that comes that the dream practices of different traditions around the world are gonna start to spread the way that yoga and mindfulness did, did before because it's all part of being in connection with that spirit world and being able to co-create with the universe instead of being at the mercy of what's happening around you, like being able to be in all of that requires relationship and inner practice. And so I think the more that we can find ways to bring mindfulness, breath practice, body practices, grief practices, because that's the other part of dominant culture is like, we're really afraid of aging. We're really afraid of death. We're really afraid of grieving. And it's part of the cycle of life. Um, and so part of the sixth sun is coming back into relationship with the larger cycles of life and the earth. Um, so the more we can help people find those paths, those practices, um, not that it'll be easy for them, but they'll at least be able to be present with the changes that are happening. So I'll go ahead and share really quickly before we, cause I like to do context before, um, I think some people just, it, it helps them to understand the context of what we're doing before we jump on in. So um, in this time of the sixth sun, it's important to be healing karmic and ancestral patterns for ourselves and future generations. Um, and it's, we talk a lot about releasing old winds. We carry a lot of ancestral old winds and patterns of self-sabotage kind of in the lower back area. And we want to work with new winds to carry us on our path for our health, our well-being, for being in our path and purpose. And uh, we want to celebrate and embrace the many gifts our ancestors passed us, the talents they passed us. But we also want to make sure we clear that trauma and unhealthy patterns so that we're not recreating those in our lives. So clearing assists them as well as us. And... Um, so the ancestral practice that I'll be talking about um, and guiding us through, I'll just share a quick image. Uh, so we talk about the land of the ancestors as Miklan. And in the Toltec practice, dogs are very important guides to the land of ancestors. Itzquintle is a particular breed of dog that's um, known in Mexico as a hairless dog. And they were considered very sacred and also our escorts to the land of the ancestors. And we always talk about the direction of the north as being the direction of the ancestors. And then in the Toltec too, we think about rain and sacred waters as an element for purification and cleansing. And so the, the practice we'll do will be a meditation around um, going into the ancestor realm and 
asking for some clearing of the heavy karma and trauma of our ancestors. And we call this the process of ensoñación and uh, sueño is a dream. So this is a practice of dreaming while awake. So a lot of things that we do in meditation and when we're asleep are ensoñaciones to create shift in the in the sleeping time or a different consciousness so that we make changes for ourselves and for those in the spirit world. And so just a little bit background around, around the ancestral practice that we'll be doing. And so I'm going to invite you just to close your eyes if you feel comfortable and take a deep breath in and out. And as you continue to breathe in and out, just see if you can send some gratitude down towards your feet, towards the core of Mother Earth. And as you do that, uh, send that gratitude down towards Mother Earth for all the ways that she supports us, provides for us. And feel some of that energy coming back up towards your feet, up into your body. And when we send gratitude and are in right relationship, that we can receive some energy from Mother Earth that will support us in this work. And as you're doing that, also see if you can send some gratitude out through your crown, out towards the universe, to the cosmos, to creator, by whatever name you know. I'm giving thanks for the universe that we're a part. We're both a Earth citizen, but we're also a galactic citizen, cosmic citizen. We belong to so much more. So sending gratitude in that direction to the spirit world that way and allowing some of that energy to come back and support us from the stars, from the universe. And all of that energy being centered at our heart so that we're in balance with the, the above and the below, that both have things to offer us. We're both divine cosmic beings of the universe, and we're also children of Mother Earth. And is that centered in our heart? See if you can feel behind you the seven generations of ancestors who came before you. You may not know their names. You may not be able to see their faces. But just to feel from your heart behind you those who came before us, who dreamt us into being, who made our lives possible. And as you're feeling that, feel also in front of you the next seven generations yet to come, many of them yet unborn, that we're praying into being, that we're doing this healing work for so that they can inherit a different future and that they're calling us to do the work that we're meant to do right now so they can inherit at the time of the sixth son. As you feel all that centered in your heart, we're now going to breathe in a particular way to be in the right energy to do this work. And we're going to breathe in and out together nine times, breathing in through our nose and out through our mouth for nine breaths. So I will just say nine in, nine out, nine times as we breathe together. So just follow along, breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. Nine in, nine out. 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 Now, as you continue to breathe in and out, I want you to visualize the image of a dog. It could be a dog from your childhood. It could be a dog you have now. It may be a wolf or a coyote. 
It could be any dog that you like. And visualize this dog being in front of your navel, in your belly button area, in front of your belly button area. And this is where we enter into ensoñación through our intuitive ways of knowing. And as you continue to breathe in and out, just gradually see that image of the dog traveling from your navel up to the center of your chest as you breathe in and out. And now the dog is in front of your chest. And in a moment, I'm gonna ask us to breathe out and as we do so, the dog will come in front of our chest and begin to walk with you by their side in the direction of the north, which is the, land, with the direction of the ancestors. So with your next breath out, visualize that dog coming out and beginning to walk, and you're walking alongside the dog. And you and the dog are walking towards the north. You're walking down a path together. And ahead, you see the mouth of a cave far in the distance. And so you and the dog begin walking towards it, towards the mouth of the cave. And as you come to the mouth of the cave, you, uh, you make an offering. Perhaps it's some flowers, some cornmeal, some tobacco, some cedar. Whatever it is, you're making a small offering at the mouth of the cave, asking permission to enter into Miklan and the land of the ancestors. Now that you've asked permission and made an offering, you walk through the mouth of the cave with a dog. And you go down a narrow passageway and you see an opening up ahead. As you find your way into the clearing in the cave, you're still within the cave, but in a larger area, you see and visualize people in your family that you knew or have passed away, your ancestors. You may see them as human beings. You may see them as points of lights. Sometimes people see them as dogs because dogs are our uh, connection to the ancestors in the Toltec. And you may see nothing at all, but know that when we're in Sonia Sion, that when we make these intentions, that these things are happening, whether we see them or not. So as you see these points of lights or beings coming into the cave, we're grateful for those ancestors who have come to be with us. And then very humbly and gently, we ask for those healthy ancestors, the ones who stayed grounded in their ways to form an outer ring and then if there are some ancestors perhaps who had more trauma or pain and suffering, more unskillfulness, that they're in a ring held within the more healthy ancestors. So we have two rings of ancestors, but the healthier ones holding space for the ones that were less healthy. And we're in a circle too, on the outside with our healthy ancestors. And as we're sitting there in the circle with them, in the language of dreams, where rain means purification, we humbly ask for gentle rains to come and support the healing of our ancestors, the purification of the old winds of our ancestors. So we begin to see these sparkly, beautiful clouds come overhead, the two circles of ancestors. And we begin to feel a gentle, warm, tropical rain that begins to clear the pain, the suffering of those ancestors. And then we feel their delight and their joy in feeling this gentle, warm rain that is purifying their old winds, their trauma, their suffering, their challenges, that they're delighting and perhaps even dancing in that gentle, warm rain because of how much lighter they feel. We give thanks to the sacred waters for their capacity to purify and heal heavy karma, heavy suffering. And we continue to feel that one gentle warm rain on us, on our ancestors, helping them heal and clear. 
your ancestral old winds and patterns that perhaps we don't want to carry anymore that was in our family line, patterns of addiction or illness, depression, just allowing that to roll away for them and for us with this gentle rain. And we also ask for the ancestors that suffer in our, in our current country, in our homelands that our ancestors came from, to heal some of that suffering as well. Just keeping, keeping that image of feeling the rain, the gentle and warm rain healing all of them. And you see yourself basking in the rain with your ancestors, seeing yourself and your ancestors delighting in the rain, joyous in the rain, feeling lighter because of this gentle rain and this ensoñación, this dreaming while awake with our ancestors. Again, you see some of them delighting in this feeling of joy and purification. Feeling grateful for this time that you're spending with them to help ease some of their burden that they've been carrying so long. Helping to clear some of the disconnection that many of them felt. Those who disconnected from the earth and the earth ways those who disconnected from their ancestors and felt unrooted, those who experienced trauma and leaving their homelands for so many different reasons. And now that we've allowed so much gentle rain to clear so much for them, we turn to all of them and say, thank you for taking this time to be with us, for being in partnership for clearing in the ancestral line, for unburdening and clearing for them and for you and for future generations. So we know that any healing for us is healing for them, any healing for them is healing for us, that be, it is beyond time and space that when we do this healing work, it reverberates in different dimensions and in different generations. And we expend, extend our love and compassion to them for all the ways that they were did the best they could in the times that were here and to let them know that we want to help continue this healing in our line. And we just turn and say thank you to them. We tell them it's our time to go, that we can't stay here, but it may not be our last visit. We might visit again. And so we just bow to them with gratitude and we begin to walk back to the mouth of the cave with the dog. And as we reach the opening in the cave, we turn and take one last look and just wave goodbye to them. Thank them for all the ways they made our lives possible and, the, and for doing the best they could. And that we want more guidance and, and relationship with them, especially the healthier ones, that we want to do some of this continued healing work with their partnership. So we say our goodbyes and we begin to walk out of the cave with the dog, walking back down the path to where we where we started from. As we reach the place where we are sitting here right now, where we began our meditation, we turn to the dog and we thank it for being our escort, for being a good partner in this work, for being the guide and the mediator between us and the ancestor world. And so we bow to that dog and give it our thanks and we allow it to go on its way. And then we come back into our body and into this place we're sitting right now, this chair. And we clap our hands together and we say, thank you that my ancestors heal, Omateo. We say, thank you for all the people who lived in my line, in this country and other countries, in our homelands that made travels so that I could be here today, Omateo. 
give thanks for this beautiful dog spirit that supported our journey and our and this healing work. We give thanks for the gentle rains that helped to purify and heal some of this heaviness for our ancestors. And we give thanks for the sacred time of ensoñación and dreaming while awake. And we come back into our bodies now. We simply just say thank you to all that is that allowed this time together. And then when we come together um, back into our bodies, I will count to four and we'll come back to the room. One, two, three, four. So I invite you to gently open your eyes. If you feel like it, you can wiggle, shake, move your body, tap your body, whatever makes you feel like you're coming back into your body, stretching after that meditation. And just to take a couple deep breaths in. And we have a few minutes, so I want to give some time to see if there's any sharings people have around what they saw or what they felt or what they noticed or if there's questions you might have, but definitely want to hear if there's any things that are on your heart about what you experienced in your journey. I have one question in your guidance to come back into our bodies. I experienced myself to be in my body as I was in the practice. I felt more that I was coming back into my um, thinking mind yeah. engaged sort of interactive transactional mind mm -hmm. but not coming back into my body so could you speak to whether that's just what happened for me or or why the the words you offered us were coming back into your body i think people experience this differently and i think because um you're probably an experienced meditator. That's probably true for you. <laughs> and some people feel like they're going off into spirit world or astral traveling or whatever it is they call that. Um, and then feel like a need to ground um, back here again. Um, yeah, yeah. And so I think of kind of thinking mind about this connection with the cosmic and the universe and spirit that way. And then I think about being in the body and in the breath is connecting with the earth as well. And so wanting again to invite us to be back in that wholeness of holding on to both our intuitive and in our and our intellectual and operating in balance with them. Um, and and my experience of most people is that they're in their minds too much and are really disconnected. I know I know a lot of Asian teachers that teach Qigong and and acupuncture and other things. And they said, I see all these people in the West who are really, there's this part is really connected and everything down below is disconnected, <laughs> particularly in the West, um, not, not in all cultures. But I think that's part of why I'm always asking people to make sure they don't lose connection to their body Thank and their you. breath. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think that the more I go on this mystic path, um, I feel like spirit and ancestors are always talking to me and they tell me to do things and I don't always know why they tell me to do things, but I also trust them. <laughs> and I trust that intuition more than I did when I was younger. Um, like, you know, just they'll say like, you have to go to the coffee shop and you have to go to Sokolos coffee. And I'm like, I'm not, I don't want coffee. Like I already had coffee this morning. They'll say, that's not why you're going, just go, you know, and then I'll go. And then I run into someone I'm supposed to be there. Like when we're in that intuitive space, the synchronicities happen all the time when we're listening. And that is an aspect of this time of the sixth sun is like dropping more and more into that intuitive and that discernment around the messages we get. And trusting that when we're listening, that there's guidance that's coming for us. Um, and I, my, 
one of the things I often say to my husband is that when we're early in our marriage, I said, when I listen to spirit and ancestors and I follow their guidance, my life tends to unfold. doesn't mean I don't have challenges or difficulties, but I feel like I'm not holding everything by myself and I'm being guided. And when I override or ignore or fear the, that guidance, that's usually when my life gets more difficult. And so I know that time of the sixth sun is about learning to cultivate some of that listening and that intuition. And so I'm really glad that you trusted your intuition around that with, with this ancestor and this being that wanted to support you and be by your side. And I'm sure that they're really happy too, that you felt that and, and that you trusted that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so much of the time of the sixth sun is, is needing some of that medicine from the feminine to come forward to help yeah. with the healing um, and to restore its partnership with the masculine in a healthy and balanced way. Right. Um, I, I often say patriarchy has been hard on everyone in the system. Racism has been hard on everyone in the system. It's just dehumanized people in different ways. Um, it's, it's taught, you know, certain people that they have to turn off parts of their humanity to become who, who they are in that system. And so I think about that a lot of both done a lot of healing work with women and women's retreats and women's circles, but I've also been pulled into a lot of boys and men of color and male healing spaces because men need healing too. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of un unwellness and the men in our family, a lot of addiction, a lot of numbing of a lot of pain that they were not allowed to express and process and so and and when we don't learn how to navigate and cope and work with our emotional pain then that's when it kind of and comes out you know in other ways uh, one of the my favorite writers in this regard is Resma Menachem who wrote a book called My Grandmother's Hands um, and talks a lot about ancestral healing and why it's important in this time um, and that all of us have ancestors who need healing. And all of us also have ancestors who were indigenous to place and knew the old ways. And a lot of those people were women. Um, and there's ancestors back that and I also say, like when you're praying, ask for those healthy ancestors who were connected to the old ways, connected to the earth, connected to ancestors. Ask them to help you remember because they're back there and they want to help us. I'm going to put my contact information in the in the chat area there in case you want to follow up uh, with other questions you might have had. But I just want to encourage you to do what calls you to do the work around connecting with ancestors, healing ancestors, asking for their assistance. They want to help us. And my understanding, too, is just that this time of the sixth sun that we're supposed to be co-creating with each other, we're also supposed to be co-creating with the non-human realm, with the ancestors, with the earth. Um, and then we actually can't bring that new time into being if we're not in connection with the non-human realm and the beloved unseen. Um, I always talk about these being spirit beings on the other side as the beloved unseen, and they want, they're want they very wise teachers and they wanna help us. And um, until we reach out and start building relationship with them. And it's not that they don't want to help us, it's they can't help us if we're not in relationship. Um, and to have that discernment around, you know, the healthy ones and perhaps the ones that are less healthy. And to just to say, my one of my teachers said to me, when you're asleep, you're so open to everybody, Brenda. I see all these beings trying to get through with messages. And she said, when you go to sleep, ask for your healthy ancestors or your spirit guides or whoever it is that you call on spirit, ask them to put a bubble of protection around you when you sleep and to only allow those through that have good intention that want to help you with your health and well-being and your path and your purpose and to please keep everybody else out so that we're, you know, we're having that discernment about who's contacting us from the other side and, and, um, and that their intentions are good. Only those with good intentions. Yeah. I think that we're at time. Yes, Brenda, I want to thank you for your generosity in helping us and sharing these rich practices and in wisdom and insights that you've uh, provided to us in your sessions in the summit. Thank you very much for your work in the world. 
Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's been an honor to share with you. And I thank you and I thank your ancestors for being here today. Any blessings. <laughs>